The LA Times would write about the band Seven Mary Three. The members of rock band Seven Mary Three belong to a minority of young rockers, those willing to acknowledge that the road to commercial success is paved with compromise. It's not often that you hear rock and roll bands embrace those kinds of labels. And the other day I was listening to the bonfire on Sirius XM. Those guys have been giving me a lot of shout outs over the past year or so, and I'm so grateful for that. When you're a YouTuber, it tends to feel really insular and small. So I honestly have a hard time coming to terms that people even watch my videos, at least when I look at the thousands of views. One of the episodes of the bonfire I listened to had them discussing the 90s era band Seven Mary Three. And usually when I come across a band that maybe I'd forgotten about, the first thing I like to do is go through my request form. There's already several people who have requested this band. By the way, guys, if you want to submit ideas for me on future episodes, use the link in the description box below. I go through the spreadsheet every week. And let's get to today's topic. Whatever happened to the band Seven Mary Three, who were best known for the mid 90s hit song Cumbersome? Seven Mary Three formed in 1992 when two post-secondary students with the same first name met midway through their junior year while attending the College of William and Mary in Virginia. I'm of course talking about vocalist and rhythm guitarist Jason Ross and lead guitarist Jason Pollock. Both men were born in Kansas, with Pollock moving to Virginia later on and having a TV-less childhood telling Deseret News I listened to all my parents' classic rock albums, the radio, really anything that sounded melodic and good. I also went to see a lot of local folky mountain music. I learned to play at college and realized this is what I wanted to do. When I met Jason and heard him sing, I really fell into it, he'd say. Ross and Pollock would both pursue degrees in the arts. By this point in time, both men hadn't been playing guitar for very long, with Ross telling Ear of Newt. Jason started playing when he was a sophomore in college, so I guess he's into his fourth year playing now. I had a dusty old guitar sitting in the closet, and I pretty much learned everything from him, so neither one of us had been playing very long. For his English degree, Ross was able to get half of his college credit by writing short stories and poetry, which inspired a lot of the lyrical content on Seven Mary Three's debut record, according to Ear of Newt. Both Jasons would bond over their love of the 80s TV show Chips and Gabriel Garcia Marquez novels. The duo soon began writing songs, but Ross was nervous about getting on a stage and performing in front of people, telling Rolling Stone, I'd always kind of wanted to perform, but I was too much of a coward to get on stage. Jason was able to push me into it. Within several months of writing their first song, the pair performed as an acoustic duo before adding bassist Casey Daniel and drummer Giddy Kalsa and began playing local coffee shops and clubs and doing their best to avoid the highly lucrative college party circuit that would have forced the quartet to play covers in their sets. The band's name was inspired from a code name for Larry Wilcox's unit on the show Chips. Pollock would admit about the band's name, there's no great significance or anything, we were just tired of trying to think of a cool name. Seven Mary Three would build a pretty big local following with Ross telling Spin Magazine, who the typical fan of the band was in the early 90s saying, at a typical show there's a 35 year old guy wearing a hand tool leather belt and his name carved in the back standing next to a teenage goth girl. On the strength of their original compositions, the band was able to gain a grassroots following in both Virginia and in Florida, and the band also shared some roots with the Sunshine State, as Ross's parents would move to Orlando from Connecticut when he was just 10 years old, with Ross joking to Rolling Stone. What they didn't know is that most of the people were high school friends of Casey's and mine, when referring to their large audiences in the state. It was during this time the band wrote, recorded, released, and produced their first record churn on their own label, Five Spot Records, which they sold at gigs. The band would press nearly 5,000 copies, mostly through funds that they made off concerts, with the record landing in some Best Buy stores in Orlando and about 10 independent chains between Williamsburg and Orlando. The band credited their college educations with giving them some business acumen. Chris Bayer, who owned an independent record store in Williamsburg, would tell Billboard magazine, We cater to the William and Mary audience. Good bands that tour in this college market can build up an incredible following. Dave Matthews did it. Mayer would admit that the album Churn was one of the store's top 10 biggest selling records of 1994, even outselling Pearl Jam. Ross would tell the Las Vegas Weekly of the overarching themes of the album, saying it's, and I quote, One of people dealing with things in life, dealing with your feelings, dealing with your fellow men, dealing with women, and how you really have to work at it, he'd say. 
the album's opening track, a song called Cumbersome, would catch the attention of a local Orlando radio station, WJRR, who up until this point was credited for breaking Collective Soul by playing a demo version of their song Shine. WJRR added the single Cumbersome to their rotation in January of 1995, and every time the song was played on the radio, the phone lines lit up. It's important to note that this was the original six-minute version of the song. Steve Robertson, who worked for WJRR and was the assistant program director and midday personality, would tell Billboard, When I first heard Cumbersome, I said to my promotions director that these guys are the next Collective Soul. I got the same feeling from this song that I got from Collective Soul's Shine. We started playing it and after about 100 spins, we started testing it, and it came back in the top 10 after 30, and was pretty consistent after that, he'd say. Apart from their talent, Luck also had an important role in the band's history. Ross would tell Billboard that it wasn't very often you hear a local rock band on commercial radio who was unsigned. He would say that was definitely good old luck. That luck would pass on to their tours as during their unsigned years, the band landed some prime touring spots opening for Live, Matthew Sweet, and the Toadies. Side note guys, I've done a whole video on the Toadies and Live's career. The links are down below. Ross would tell Spin Magazine how things came full circle for the group when they opened up for Live. Looking back in 1991, Ross would tell the magazine, Me and my friend came down from Tampa to see Live, and man, we were blown away. At the end of the show, their singer Ed reached out and pulled me and my friend on stage. Three years later, we're selling out 10,000-seater arenas and opening for Live, he'd say. Ross would tell Billboard how the band managed to land an opening spot for Live before even being signed to a label, saying, We lucked into that because we sent them a disc and the manager called us and said they had a cancelled opener. As someone at our label said, this isn't rocket science, it's not like curing cancer. You write good songs, say what you believe in, and people will either follow you or not, he'd say. The band would soon ink a deal with indie label Mammoth Records, who had a partnership with Atlantic. The band would speak to Billboard magazine about why they chose to sign with a smaller label in Mammoth, with Ross telling the magazine, We wanted to rise to the top very quickly and have a lot of attention paid by the label. That's hard to come by with a label right away. With Mammoth being a smaller homegrown label, we could go to them and receive the attention and have the distribution and support of Atlantic. The big and little combo works. Along with Seven Mary Three, another up-and-coming group that was signed to the same label was the band Squirrel Nut Zippers and Juliana Hatfield. Ross would tell Ear of Newt, Mammoth is really into nurturing bands through different stages and development. It's such an eclectic group of bands on the roster that you don't feel like you're competing with other bands for attention, he'd say. Mammoth's whole marketing approach for the bands on their roster was something that they referred to as grassroots. They would normally call Pacific Coast One Stop and Simi Valley the nation's third largest distributor of music and video-based products and see which records were selling well and then get Atlantic to help with promotion. Atlantic would use the same method to see which indie bands were worth signing. The music of Seven Mary Three would be inspired by the same anxieties as their Generation X peers. If you've ever dealt with anxiety, then you know uncertainty in events beyond your control or your worst enemy. Ross would tell the LA Times, Our parents have been through divorces and it's had a tremendous impact on us. I think that often our ideals of the perfect family unit or any romantic relationship are just that, ideals. And we love more in our minds than in reality. Can you be faithful? Can you be everything that's desired of you? Our expectations simply too high? It's a very difficult but essential part of a human condition to try and understand. These anxieties and trials would show up in the tracks Devil Boy, My My, and Margaret. Following the success of Cumbersome, the band would relocate to Orlando, and Mammoth opted to release the group's debut record, albeit under a new name called American Standard. Their label would also have Seven Mary Three re-record most of the songs while throwing in a few new tunes. The album was given a new title to make the record sound more palatable to rock radio, with Ross telling Ear of Newt, I think that the title has begun to take on all different kinds of organizations. Somebody said there's a toilet manufacturer here in the States that's American Standard, and then there's the American Standard Stratocaster. I think we were just trying to come up with something that kind of embodied the ethos of Manifest Destiny and all of that. Kind of that 1800s pushing out the frontier kind of vibe, he'd say. Both Ross and Pollock would receive producing credits on their debut album, along with veteran producer Tom Morris. While the group acknowledged they had to make compromises after signing to a label, Ross would admit to the LA Times, We basically produced the record. I realize that there are compromises to be made, but if you keep your head about it, you can transcend it, he'd say. 
The label would issue a shortened four-minute version of Cumbersome as the lead single from the album, and it would receive heavy play on MTV and would peak at number one on the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart, and would also have crossover appeal peaking at number 39 on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. Jason Pollock, who co-wrote the song about a relationship of his gone awry, tells the story of a woman who's grown disinterested in her partner. The band would follow up the success of Cumbersome with two other well-received singles, including Water's Edge, a song dealing with an abduction of a young girl, and My My, both of which would chart in the top 20 on the mainstream rock charts. The album would go on to sell over 1.1 million copies in America and be certified platinum. Seven Mary Three would frequently be compared to other bands at the time who were popular, including Hootie and the Blowfish and the Dave Matthews Band, with their DIY approach. Ross would tell Rolling Stone, I think the reason bands like Hootie, Dave Matthews, and to some degree ourselves, have done as well as we have is that there's a work ethic and a willingness to give to the audience. While the band had a lot to celebrate, they also had a lot of criticisms levied against them from critics, who compared them to other popular 90s alternative rock acts including Stone Temple Pilots and Pearl Jam. But Ross would handle such criticisms with grace, telling the LA Times that the comparisons, and I quote, used to upset me, but I've convinced myself to be secure in my own identity. As a young band, it's part of paying your dues, and you've got to survive your influences. The comparisons were also a bit unfair and lazy, as the band drew on influences including classic and southern rock, while the bands of the Pacific Northwest were more influenced by the punk and metal scenes of the 70s and 80s. By 1997, the band's label Mammoth would split from Atlantic, and this resulted in Seven Mary Three's follow-up Rock Crown being put in limbo for almost half a year and being delayed. The dissolution of Mammoth's relationship with Atlantic resulted in the band jumping ship to Atlantic, However, a deal would be worked out with her old label, Mammoth, who would still share in profits from the record and help promote the album. Jason Ross would tell Billboard in 1997, The last six months have been a serious test in patience and faith. It's like trying to believe in a new religion or something. There's all this mystery out there and you have people telling you that everything is going to be alright. The band's new label, Atlantic, of course, tried to spin the delay as a positive, telling Billboard that it served to elevate the band's attention from the major label and that it allowed people at the company to become more familiar with the group's music. Longtime fans of the group were surprised with the sound of the band's second record, Rock Crown, which showed more introspective lyrics, heavier folk influences, an organ player, and softer sounding song arrangements. But to the band members, they didn't see the change in sound as straying too far from their roots with Ross telling Billboard, When we started playing songs five years ago, we were basically writing acoustic guitars, not these big electric ones. We spent so much time on the road supporting American Standard and saw so much that we have never been exposed to that it really resonated with what we were doing on the back of our tour bus. We were sitting there with guitars telling stories to each other, he'd say. The band's label attempted to do the same grassroots marketing as their first record, but Rock Crown was met with lukewarm reviews. Not to mention a less than stellar commercial performance, with the album only peaking at number 75 on the Billboard charts, not even going gold selling around 300,000 copies. The band returned the following year with their follow-up titled Orange Avenue that was met with even less fanfare peaking in number 121, selling around 150,000 units, and it would serve as their final album for Atlantic. Despite getting the opportunity to open for Aerosmith, Jason Pollock would tell the Cleveland scene about the band's commercial struggles saying, Actually, lately, I haven't been paying too much attention to it, really because I don't care much, honestly. It's kind of a deadening of that emotion, so you don't have to face the ups and downs. The only question may be, who deadens the worry better, Bud or Jack, he'd ask. Meanwhile, drummer Giddy Kelso would explain the change in the band's sound on their last two albums, telling Rolling Stone, We made American Standard when we were fresh out of college, and it represented that time. With Rock Crown, it was very much a response to going from playing bars and fraternities to getting a record deal to selling a million records in a year. And Orange Avenue is a response to the last few years and us being a little further away than at the beginning and being able to look back and go, okay, I get it now. By 1999, Jason Pollock would leave the band for good and Thomas Giuliano would be brought in to replace him. The success of Cumbersome seemed to haunt the band. The group would admit that some people would walk out of their concerts after they played the song. And Jason Ross would tell V13.net, we have never really let anyone in the studio label-wise ever. And I think that distanced us from some of the help we needed at certain points in our career. I navigated away from people trying to get me to write Cumbersome Part 2. It's like we've put so much attention towards really learning our craft since the early releases. Convincing an audience we are more than just one song has been a large part of my job description for the last decade, he'd say. By 2002, the band landed back with Mammoth Records and released their follow-up album, The Economy of Sound, which sold around 50,000 copies. Mammoth would soon fold into Disney's Hollywood Records, 
and the band was once again left without a label while shopping around new demos to find a new home while also touring with Gin Blossom, Spin Doctors, and Sponge on the New World Disorder tour. By the way guys, I've done videos on all these bands and whatever happened to them, the links are down below. Jason Ross would tell the Orlando Sentinel in 2002 his feelings on the band's new album at the time, calling it, and I quote, abysmal, and going on to say, it's like a nightmare. Fortunately, we've stayed out on the road and did what we could to support it. That's what sustains the band. He would also look back at the band's career up until this point, telling the same publication, the first time it happens to you, you become pretty jaded, and the anger is the first reaction, referring to being dropped by the label. The second time, you're a little more seasoned and you can say, this is the way the business works. The third time, you force yourself to be positive because maybe that little hint of negativity is what people are seeing and you definitely don't want them to see that. It's the only way to be. I can't say that the last record did what we wanted it to do, but I did my job. Ross would put the blame on the album's poor performance on their own label Mammoth, saying, if they knew what they were doing, they'd still be open. Seven Mary Three put out two more albums, including 2004's Dislocation and 2008's Day and Night Driving, both of which were their first set of albums to not chart. By 2006, the group's drummer would leave the band, and in 2012, the band called it quits for good, with frontman Jason Ross going on to become the head of media and strategic partnerships for The Bowery Presents, one of New York's most powerful music production companies. He'd be responsible for establishing partnerships with some of the biggest brands, including Converse, Heineken, and American Express. Then as recently as December of 2021, the band posted on their website that they are sitting on tons of unreleased music, some which had been written pretty recently and some that was written years ago. Fans can go onto the band's website and sign up and get access to the material, some of which will be free, while others will have a nominal fee attached to them. However, the band's website would stress that no live dates seem to be coming in the near future. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe and we'll see you again on Rock Roll Your Stories, take care.